you need this. Friends, we gather together this afternoon to celebrate the life and to honor the memory of Dr. Berger. Nate's family so very much appreciates your presence here this afternoon. As you undoubtedly know, at difficult times, there is nothing more healing, more comforting than the presence of each of us to the others and especially to the mourners. So on behalf of the family, we very much appreciate your being here this afternoon. Me smile at a feet, I don't know you row it, lower sar. Be not a shy or be tiny on me, no hot yan na haleni. Na she is over. Yan a cheni of a maglet sadak, lama anshamo. Come, Kirere, we get some of it. Lo, Hira, Kiata, Himani. Shift the home, Shantaha, Hemayana, Hamuni. Ta aruch lefanai, Shulhan. Nagad Tzorirai Dishanta vashem en roshi Kosir vaya Ach tov echased yirdifuni Koyam echayai Bishaviti Bevet Adonai Leorech Yamim Adonai Ma Adam Vateda Ehu Ben Enosh Vatchashvehu O Lord, what are we that you have regard for us? What are we that you of us. We are like a breath. Our days are as a passing shadow. We come and go, we go like grass, which in the morning shoots up renewed, in the evening it fades and it withers. You cause us to turn to dust, saying, return, you mortal creatures. Would that we were wise, that we understood whither we are going. For when we die, we carry nothing away. Our glory does not accompany us. Mark the wholehearted and behold the upright. They shall have peace. The author of the Bible's 150 Psalms describes for us in language both poignant and succinct the nature of the good life and the fruits of that life. Happy are those followed the counsel of the wicked or taken the path of sinners or joined the company of the insolent. Rather, the teaching of God is their delight and they study that teaching day and night. They are like a tree planted beside streams of water whose foliage never fades and whose fruit always flourishes. One of the most famous language, I'm sure you'll agree with me, is the 23rd Psalm. It's deservedly famous, not only because of its succinct and, and poignant message, but because it clearly could not have been written by a teenager or a person in his or her 20s or even 30s, because this psalm captures the ripeness of a life fully lived, for all of its glory and all of its depredations. The psalmist does not tell us that there is going to be a solution to our problems. 
nor even that the omnipotent God is going to solve them for us. In this sense, the psalmist is ruthlessly real. Nevertheless, the psalmist offers us hope, not blind hope, but a sophisticated hope that takes into account the difficulties that we all uh, come across in our lives. If you know the psalm, join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Kohelet, the author of the biblical book of Ecclesiastes, reminds us that for everything there is a season, a time for every experience under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a dance, a time to throw stones and a time to throw stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep balance and a time to speak. Dr. Nathan Berger died this past Saturday, just three weeks shy of his 84th birthday. To say that he lived a productive life would be an understatement. To say that he made an impact on his profession would be too tepid. To say that he had an effect on people's lives would be too narrow. Indeed, he was all of these, productive, impactful, influential, but superlatively, memorably, lasting, and in detail that are known to so many of us who are gathered here today to sing Nate's praises and to celebrate his accomplishments. Nate was born and raised in Philadelphia, the oldest of three brothers. He graduated from Central High School and went on to the Temple Pharmacy School on his way to becoming a pharmacist a profession that his immigrant parents regarded as safe, remunerative, and steady. Nevertheless, from the pharmacy school, Nate moved on to Temple University itself, where he registered as a pre-med student. From there to the Hannum School, then an internship at the Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, a resident fellowship at the Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, and a faculty appointment at Washington University. In 1953, Nate came to Cleveland as a professor of medicine with a specialty in hematology and oncology. And from there to the multitude of accomplishments that if distributed over several professionals, would still fill many pages of several resumes. For Nate was the founder of the Seidman Cancer Center at the University Hospitals, where he brought the center to prominence. He was the first chief of hematology and oncology of the oncology division of Case Western Reserve University, the founding director of the Case Cancer Research Center, a vice president of medical affairs, 
founder and director of the Scientific Enrichment and Opportunity Program dedicated to engaging underprivileged and underrepresented minority high school students in cutting edge laboratory research. In addition, Nate was a distinguished university professor and the Hannah Payne Professor of Research and Experimental Medicine at Case Western University, and the dean of the university's storied medical school from 1993 to 2002. These accomplishments, I'm sure you will agree, would be enough for 10 or tens of people. But there is more. Nate was awarded numerous grants from the National Health and other agencies, and he was internationally uh, in, an internationally recognized expert in the field of energy balance and cancer. During his career, he authored more than 400 biomedical publications, the last of which was published just two days before he died. He was on the board of numerous biomedical journals. And even in his last months, when his health was in decline, making it difficult for him to move around on his own, there was Nate, working diligently in his home office, devoted to his profession and to medicine's enormous capacity to make the lives of all of us better and better. Over the past couple of days, I have had conversations about Nate with my dear friends, Drs. Kate, uh, Kent and Trish Smith, both of whom had worked closely with Nate and therefore him quite well. Here in my own words, is what Kent and Trish had to say. That Nate was not only an honored leader at CWRU and the medical school, but also the kind of leader who worked diligently to help those who worked for him, encouraging and promoting their work, supporting them when they experienced setbacks, mentoring their efforts to keep working and to keep on striving. As our dean, Trish and Kent remarked, and now I quote them, Nate was revered and loved, not only for his extraordinary competence and professionalism, but also for his caring, for his encouragement, and his willingness to celebrate in public the achievements of those who worked with him. Nate simply wanted others to succeed, and he focused on helping to make this happen. In this regard, and this is something that Nate's family emphasized when I spoke with him yesterday afternoon, that for all of his accomplishments, for all the recognition he received, Nate simply had no ego. Supreme self-confidence, yes. Egocentricity, no. And I quote, a strong will tempered by humanity. That was one of the ways that Nate's family described him yesterday to me. Indeed, Nate had a distinctive way of tapping into the strengths of others, of lifting them up. And a wonderful illustration of this is the Scientific Enrichment and Opportunity Program to which I have already referred, a program that Nate initiated and continued to nurture down through the years. It was a program that sought to engage vulnerable inner city high school students in cutting edge laboratory work. A six week, 30 hours a week summer program that opened so many possibilities for these youngsters to engage in research in the presence of skilled mentors, to develop what called thought skills, the enlarged capacity to write 
and to speak clearly and to be able to present one's work to others. All of this over 20 plus summers for more than 500 city inner city students, lifting them up by giving them the skills to fashion a better life for themselves. And because the summer was the time for these kids to help their families financially, Nate saw to it that each of them had a salary to compensate for the summer jobs they were unable to have. And over all these years, Nate was the program's organizing, sustaining, and animating spirit. Indeed, Nate Merger, Nate Merger was larger than life. And for his many accomplishments and for his many contributions, he was awarded in 2023 the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine Lifetime Achievement Award. He attended this ceremony in his wheelchair, offered inspiring remarks, and concluded his presentation with the Jewish prayer for gratitude and for hope, the Shehechianu, which reads as follows. We praise you, Lord, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and enabled us to arrive at this special moment. And this gesture and this prayer reflect something else that Trish and Kent had to say about Nate, that he was Jewish to his core. Nate loved the rituals and the celebrations of his faith, large and I imagine robust, Passover seders especially, and the Jewish values with which he was raised. Most especially, our tradition's conviction that every person is created in the image of God. That every person, therefore, has an inherent and inviolable dignity. And for Nate, this was not simply a high-sounding idea. It was a, a reality that led him to actions According to his brother Mel, Nate w wanted, not only could, but Nate wanted to talk with everybody he met. A cab driver, for example. As Mel, you remarked, by the time a particular cab driver, Nate knew many of the details of the driver's life and the life of his family. Another example of Nate's curiosity, his desire to know and to understand, and his deeply ingrained respect for and interest in the lives of others. And family, for which Nate was the undisputed patriarch. He and you, Susie, rejoiced in family gatherings and both of you embraced your modern family with enthusiasm and unconditional love. And for all his professional accomplishments, Nate's family emphasized yesterday afternoon his profound impact on the lives of the people with whom he interacted. He had a deep desire, his family told me, and I quote, to look into the eyes of the other person. Nate's profound humanity, his concern for the well-being of others, his uncanny capacity to transform lives in ways large and small, this is one of Nate Berger's central legacies. And I would be remiss if I did not say something about Nate's beloved wife of 56 years, Susie. Here, in few words, is how one of Nate's family members summarized it, and I quote, Nate Berger would not have been Nate Berger without Susie, end quote. Susie, you supported Nate in all his endeavors. 
in every one of his journeys. You co-ran a lab with him. You regularly hosted dinners for 30 or more people and reception, receptions for hundreds. And you lovingly, it's hard for me to believe this, but this is what I heard, and you lovingly prepared all the food for these occasions. People call it the Hey Sues or Hey Sues success factor. Nathan Berger lived a life filled with so many of the things that gave his days and years their ballast and their richness. Vast professional accomplishment and recognition, colleagues with whom to share the journey, creative endeavors that bless the lives of others, a lively, deeply devoted family and dear and deeply devoted friends to sweeten his days. Nate Berger was a good and a lucky man, and all of us who knew, admired, and loved him were blessed by his presence in our lives. Zichrono Livrachav, the memory of Nate Berger will always be our blessing. Amen. I now want to call on several people who will reflect on the life, the, the accomplishments, and the quality of Nathan Berger. First of all, Dr. Hilliard Lazarus. Thank you. If, uh, if, if this was Nate coming to the podium, I think he would have said, uh, yeah, I'm going to show slides. <laughs> Dr. Nathan Berger truly was an icon. The Merriam-Webster dic Dictionary defines icon as a person or thing widely admired, especially for having great influence or significance in a particular sphere. I would argue that looking up this term in the dictionary, one would see Nate Berger's picture. In his career, he received numerous awards, including the Case Western Reserve University Lifetime Achievement Award, induction into the American Cancer Society Hall of Fame, and the Maurice Saltzman Award, just to name a few. But he was not only an incredible physician, scientist, and leader, but someone, as you've heard, who really loved people and he loved to party. Dr. Berger's patients also loved him. I first met Nate when he was hired in 1983. Dr. Charles C.J. Carpenter, Chief of Medicine, recruited Nate to University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center and Case Western Reserve University to be the Division Chief of Hematology Oncology. I was a junior faculty member, and immediately I was amazed at his organizational and interpersonal skills. Nate quickly recognized the need to develop more effective diagnostic and treatment strategies for treating and preventing cancer. After securing funds, he created the Ireland Cancer Center. Nate was the quintessential recruiter. He not only possessed a great eye for talent, but he also persisted in the recruiting effort and was not easily discouraged from enticing candidates to move to Cleveland. He was a master at collecting many of the top scientists and clinicians that include such notables as uh, Dr. Sandy Markowitz and Dr. Stanton Gerson, who's currently the dean of the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine whole approach to preparing for grant site visits. He regularly invited experts and potential site visitors to Cleveland to give talks. He corrected that if we could convince these people of the strength of the institution in advance, we would get high marks at the site visits, which was the case. It was not long thereafter when he and his team submitted the grant to the National 
Cancer Institute that resulted in the creation of the NIH designated Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. The people of Northeast Ohio would now be able to receive state-of-the-art cancer cares, something which continues to this day. Dr. Berger had unique leadership qualities. Every time a faculty member received an award, a grant, or was, was given academic promotion, Nate had a celebration with fine champagne at the, at the division meeting. His many novel approaches created a spirit and collegial atmosphere, and so many people wanted to be part of these activities. Nate's zest for giving parties extended to having large get on most secular and religious holidays. The division Christmas party was notable as Nate always loved to dress up as Santa Claus, quite a twist for someone who's Jewish. Any and all venues would suffice, and the festivities took place at restaurants, party centers, and especially at his home. He and his lovely and longtime spouse, Susie, regularly entertained large numbers of friends, families, colleagues, and students. On New Year's Day, for example, they had no less than 300 people for an afternoon open house at their home. Dr. continued his laboratory investigations as a world-renowned expert in DNA repair, and he was one of the pioneers exploring the properties of the enzyme polyADP ribose polymerase. This knowledge resulted in creating an effective therapy for several cancers, but he always prioritized helping others first. Somehow, he found time to mentor and be available to help so many junior people get academic promotions and grants. For more than a decade, as head of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center, then over to the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine as dean. He t worked tirelessly to get the School of Medicine recertified and he continued to recruit outstanding per personnel. After nearly a decade in this capacity, he stepped down as dean and then reinvented himself in other research areas. Amazingly, almost overnight, he became a world-renowned expert in obesity, routinely obtaining major grant funding and publishing many of scientific papers. As you've already heard, civic-minded Nate all also managed to find time to create and act as director of the Scientific Enrichment and Opportunity Program for Cleveland High School students. Each summer, Dr. Berger orchestrated a curriculum composed of lectures for about 100 students from the various municipal school districts. He enticed and even cajoled the faculty at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center in Case Western Reserve University to share their expertise in lectures, but he also arranged for those students to spend time in the laboratories of selected faculty. The overarching goal was to enhance student interest in the biomedical sciences. Nearly all of the many participants have gone on to receive undergraduate college educations, and many have also pursued uh, graduate education. On a personal note, Nate and I worked closely in several areas, some of which I'll uh, illustrate. Decades ago, together we created a unique patient bone marrow transplantation unit, one of the first of its kind in the country. In this distinct designated area of the hospital, the staff and allied personnel could provide the necessary, unique approach to deliver the highly sophisticated and technical care to ensure success of the novel approach to cancer and blood disorders. As a result of locating all bone marrow transplant patients in a specialized unit, patient care was more uniform and better. Further, this strategy facilitated the undertaking of more clinical and translation, re, translational research. And as a result, we were able to increase grant funding and generate many more scholarly publications, 
both of which led to substantial national and international recognition for University Hospital's Case Medical Center and Case Western Reserve University. Now, such specialized units are standard worldwide. After creating this unit, Nate and I together convinced the state of Ohio Department of Health to allow us to staff this facility with physician assistants and nurse practitioners. This bold move was a radical departure from relying upon house officers and, and fellows to provide care. Decades later, this approach now has become the national standard. Toward the end of his life, Nay was plagued by significant illnesses. However, he refused to be slowed down and continued to be successful in securing grant funding while still freely giving of his time to provide guidance and, guide and advice to anyone who asked for his assistance. Nate was always my go-to guy. He was a great listener, always interested, and gave great advice. More importantly, he always went to bat for me when I needed support. Like so many, many people whose lives he's touched, I cherished knowing Nate as a supervisor, colleague and, colleague and mentor, but most of all, as a friend. I quote from ha Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 2, he was a man, take him for all in all, I shall not look upon his life again. Thank you. Rabbi. Dr. Sanford Markowitz. In 1987, uh, I was finishing up my oncology fellowship at the National Cancer Institute, the NCI. I was pondering an offer to join the University of Wisconsin Cancer Center and work with one of their young investigators, Jim Wilson, to set up a colon cancer program. Then fatefully, the phone rang, and a booming voice came over the line and said, Hi, this is Nate Berger. You don't know me, but you're coming to Cleveland to work for me. I've just hired Jim Wilson for my new cancer center, and now you're coming too. <laughs> so, as ordered by the voice over the phone, Susie and I duly moved to Cleveland. And that was my first introduction to the impossibility of saying no to Nate Berger. <laughs> Nate had hired me as an assistant professor and early recruit to Cleveland's new NCI-designated cancer center that he had just created. In 1987, the idea of cancer as a discipline was still in its inception. Nate's far-reaching vision was that if he could build cancer care and cancer clinical research at university hospitals, and together build cancer basic research and scientific prowess at the Case Medical School, the synergy would create a cancer center that would be extraordinary and world-class. He convinced the NCI that he could do it, through sheer force of his personality. Nate was looking for physician scientists who, like himself, could care for cancer patients in the hospital and also shake test tubes at the medical school in search of better ways to treat the disease. He had hired Stan Gerson, and now he added me, Jim Wilson, and many others into the mix. Immediately after I arrived, Nate informed me that the protected time that he had promised me was actually protected so I could start writing grants. Every day, Nate would ask me if I'd written anything yet. <laughs> Finally, I replied, I'm hoping to have something on the page by midnight tonight. Fine, said Nate. When you're done, bring it over to the house. Nate, I said, it'll be midnight. Yeah, Nate replied. Like I said, when you're done, bring it over to the house. So from midnight to 2 a.m., I sat bleary-eyed at Nate's kitchen table 
while he brought out a red pen and rewrote every single sentence that I had drafted. <laughs> First, I learned in a way I could never forget how to write a grant. Second, I figured the take-home lesson was that Nate didn't need to sleep. That observation was correct, but it wasn't the take-home lesson. I only learned the take-home lesson years later when I asked Nate for his advice as to whether I should accept an offer to lead a cancer center at another institution. His answer was to ask if I was willing to set aside everything that I was interested in so as to make sure that first everybody else would become successful. And that was the 2 a.m. take-home lesson and that was the essence of Nate Berger. Nate was an extraordinary man, graced by an amazing and penetrating intellect, indefatigable energy and commitment, enormous humanity, and remarkable candor and integrity. And he dedicated all of it to making sure that everyone around him would become successful. No small part of Nate's success was his genuine interest in and love of people, Nate could talk to anyone about anything and from any walk or background of life, often by drawing on his experiences of growing up in the rough and tumble of Philadelphia. He loved creating opportunities for people to come together in community and celebration. If it was New Year's, it was open house at the Burgers. If it was July 4th, it was Nate's birthday, birthday picnic at the Burgers. If it was Christmas, it was the Hematology Oncology Cancer Center party, and as you've heard, often with Nate in a Santa Claus suit and Susie's cooking providing the gustatory foundation for the celebration. And if it was a Jewish holiday, it was Passover, Seder dinner, or a Yom Kippur break the fast at the Burgers. If you worked for Nate Burger, you worked hard, but you also got to celebrate often and you ate well. It's easy to recount that at Case and University Hospitals, Nate Berger created the Division of Hematology Oncology and one for Cleveland, its first NCI-recognized cancer center, uh, the Case University Hospitals, first Ireland, now Seidman Cancer Center, where as its founding director, Nate worked tirelessly to improve cancer care and develop new life-saving treatments for the nearly two million individuals in Cleveland and beyond. Today, Nate's Cancer Center spans Case, University Hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic, and all of Northeast Ohio. And as we successively repeat at Passover and recounting each of the miracles of the Exodus, Dayenu, or in translation, it would have been enough. Furthermore, it's easy to recount that Nate Berger was Dean of the Case School of Medicine, a Case Distinguished University professor, and a key leader who drove major successes at both Case and University Hospitals. And again, Dianu, it would have been enough. And to further recount that in the lab, Nate pioneered the discovery of the PARP protein as a target for cancer treatment, a prescient vision validated when PARP inhibitor drugs became FDA-approved therapies for breast and ovarian cancer. Because again, Dianu, it would have been enough or that after stepping down as dean, Nate founded an entire new NCA-funded center and discipline at Case, studying the opposing roles of obesity and exercise and cancer, an area in which he rapidly became a leading national authority because, Dianu, it would have been enough. Or that Nate founded colon cancer research at Case and University Hospitals, in early years recruiting me and Jim Wilson as junior faculty then leading us in winning an NIH program project grant to support our first colon cancer studies. And it was this seed that ultimately grew to Nate being my mentor, guide, and co-leader in our winning an NCI SPORE designation that recognized our cancer center here in Cleveland for its national excellence in GI malignancies, a recognition we shared with Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and MD Anderson. Again, Dianu, any of it simply would have been enough. Even in the final months of his life, while locked in a daily battle with physical incapacity that would have stopped anyone else, Nate continued to lead research meetings on Zoom and to publish new discoveries in leading scientific journals because his indomitable intellect, curiosity, and will simply would not be stilled. But those achievements, accolades, and contributions simply do not come close to capturing the essence of Nate Berger. 
That's best captured by being able to relate the two successor directors of the Case University Hospital's Ireland Seidman Cancer Center, both Jim Wilson and Stan Gerson, and a successor dean of the Case School of Medicine, Stan Gerson, were all individuals who Nate had recruited, mentored, and launched on careers of success. Or that Nate worked tirelessly to foster Hillard Lazarus's program that established Case and University Hospitals as one of the leading centers for bone marrow transplantation in America. And it's captured even more by relating that after retiring as dean, Nate raised the funding and launched a program to provide stipends for inner city high school kids to spend summers working in labs at Case, seeking to inspire, afford opportunities, and provide a first break for kids who had never had one before. Nate's greatest passion was truly everyone else, and truly Dayenu, that would have been enough. Nate, we sorely miss you. We will never forget you. And your memory will always be a beacon, guide, an inspiration, and a blessing. Nate's son, Revy. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Mahusa Leilam Bad Sorry, I'm going to get choked up here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children. My dad sat at my bedside every night and recited that prayer with me until I was about 15 years old. See, you all saw him as Nate Berger, the cancer center director, the chairman of, hematology, of the hematology oncology division, the dean of the medical school, a prolific researcher, a teacher, a mentor, an advisor, a domineering personality, a biomedical version of Marlon Brando and the Godfather. <laughs> but to me, Josh and Serena, he was dad. He was a silly old fart. He was the dad that would take us to McDonald's and hail his Big Mac and then ask me for a bite of my piddly little Happy Meal burger. <laughs> And in one bite, he would eat seven-eighths of my hamburger and leave me a little crescent of a sandwich. We finally learned to guard our Happy Meals with our forearms like this so we couldn't get to it. And when Dad asked us for a bite, we would cry, No, I don't want to get any of my hamburger. You're going to eat the whole thing. He was Dad. He did what dads are supposed to do. He taught us faith and love and discipline and humor and humility, and a strong work ethic. But he didn't teach us by lecturing to us or forcing us to do our homework or giving us lickings when we misbehaved. Well, actually, I got a lot of lickings, but those of you who knew me back then knew that I uh, earned them. But Josh and Serena never got lickings. Where I'm going with this is that he led by example. He never said do this or do that. He simply had very high expectations of himself, and therefore he had very high expectations of us. As such, his ethics and virtues trickled down. He didn't have to say much of anything. We just knew what he expected. I remember when I was in high school, every night I would study in his bedroom from about 8 to 11.30. He would be sitting in a beat-up old red vinyl chair writing grants or papers, and I would be sitting on the floor at his feet doing my homework. And every now and then he would chime in and ask what I was studying, and I would tell him, and he would give me his two cents on the subject. But every night I saw his dedication to his work, and it trickled down to me. 
he was so dedicated to his work that he was still doing it in that same beat-up old chair until a week before he passed. And that work ethic has trickled down to Josh and Serena and to all of his grandchildren. You see it live on in Manny with his dedication to creating culinary masterpieces and Julian with his dedication to music and then Zayd and Aiden with their dedication to tennis. And he taught us humility just through his silly day-to-day -day idiosyncrasies. Like when he was the dean of the medical school, he routinely slept on a lazy boy with a Star Wars sleeping bag. He did that so he wouldn't have to wear a CPAP for his sleep apnea, but he never cared when I revealed that habit to my fellow medical students. Also, when he was dean, most of his colleagues were driving Mercedes and Beamers and Lexuses, but he always rolled into his reserved parking space with that beat-up old clunker, that old Buick station wagon with scratches and rust and the bumper almost falling off. <laughs> he wasn't interested in showing off. He only cared to be judged by the fruits of his labor. In fact, he never really spent money on stuff. He didn't care to have a fancy car or a fancy watch or an Armani suit. He spent his time and money on relationships. He taught us that the best way to get to know somebody or to develop a relationship was to break bread together. So he spent his money on food and wine to bring people together. Thus all the parties and dinners and the genesis of the five-star sensation. And the only time I witnessed his pride get a little bruised was when in weekly lab meetings with my mom and all the postdocs and students, she would never call him Nate. She would always call him Daddy in front of everybody. <laughs> He'd pitch an idea for an experiment, and she'd say, okay, Daddy, I think, th I think that's an assay we can run. Then he would grit his teeth and mutter, Suze, did you stop calling me Daddy when I go and work? work? But that's who he was. He was our daddy. His grandkids grumpy. He taught us faith in God. He taught us Jewish tradition. He taught us acceptance through his marriage to my mom. He taught us acceptance when Serena converted to Islam and brought Sammy into the family. He taught us acceptance when I became a Messianic Jew, otherwise known as a and brought April Quinn and Kai into the family. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. He was our dad. He was so much more than what you all saw at a professional level or even at a friendship level. The words in the scripture that have given me the most comfort in these last days are the words that Paul wrote in his second letter to Timothy just before his execution. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Three days ago, my dad went home to be with the Lord. And I know on that day, he heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Nate's brother, Mel. Thank you all for coming. Um, hearing Hillard, especially and Sandy, uh, brings to mind what, what an extended family we all really are and, and you all are a part of. And that's really because, or partly because, at every holiday and every observance and every possible reason, Susie made dinner for all of us. So we all had family seders together. Hillard and Sandy never mixed one. Actually, I know Hillard long before Nate did, almost 50 years. When I, I was Hillard's medical student when he was an intern, and I was on my medical clerkship. I'm pretty sure I heard Sandy's first lecture when he came to Case, 
and he talked about how a few intestinal cells could go a little haywire or could divide a little more, and then after the exigencies of life might become cancerous. And of course, so much Susie and Nate helped us through the exigencies of life. Now, Nate was my oldest brother, 10 years ahead of me. And for most things I love and are part of my life, I followed in his footsteps. The only exception was coming to Western Reserve, now Case Western Reserve. I was here first. <laughs> and actually, by the time Nate joined the faculty, I had earned three degrees from here. So I was very happy that he was here and liked it here, and I came back to join the faculty also. But whether it was Boy Scouts and the love of camping and the outdoors, or folk singing, Pete Seeger and the Weavers, as you hear, I always had Nate's footsteps to follow in. Even though I was a little kid and quite a bit smaller than them, sometimes Nate and our other late brother, Mark Alishon, would let me join in the things they were doing, such as smuggling in non-kosher food like cheesesteaks because we were in Philadelphia and hoagies, into the basement while we were watching TV and my parents were upstairs in the living room. Nate first took me to the lab to watch him work when I was about 10. Then when I was 14, he got me a job in the lab where Susie was working for her PhD and Nate was doing his med school research project and working on getting Susie to marry him. As Roger pointed out, but most of you probably didn't know before that, Nate did not start out to be a doctor. He was going to pharmacy school with the goal of opening a corner drugstore, which would have been a tremendous step and made my parents very happy. I think his goals changed when our older cousin Steve Alishulam, who lived down the street, got into medical school. Nate switched to college to the regular college, but we had no academic role model or tradition in our family. I don't think my father, my parents were immigrants. I don't think our parents had, my father had any formal schooling at all, and my mother had to drop out of high school to help support her family. Nate switched to pre-med, and it was really hard for him, especially anatomy in the first year of med school. Actually, the old red vinyl chair Revy talked about, I can remember when my parents bought that for him because he would sit up almost all night studying. And that chair was in his room when he was like a first-year medical student. They, they gave it to him, and, and that became his, you know, study chair for like his whole life. Diligence and hard work pulled him through. I think that these three traits, direction, diligence, and hard work, are really his most outstanding characteristics. He leaves us the lev legacy of living up to the idea that regardless of where we start, where you start, with focus and hard work, you can achieve anything. Thank you. Nate's daughter. <laughs> oh gosh, this is wonderful to see you all here. I've given many hundreds of talks and lectures over many, many years. But this will be the hardest one I have to give, so I hope you can bear with me. Over many years, I have thought about the things I've wanted to say about my dad if ever given the opportunity, whether an achievement award or, God forbid, this. And unfortunately, 
the last few days and weeks have the opportunity to collect my thoughts as I would love to share them has started to escape me. So while I know these words will not convey to you what I really want my dad to hear, I hope again that you'll bear with me. A truly great man, a giant in medicine and science, a friend with endless enthusiasm, a compassionate and inspirational leader, a force of nature, a leading light, a lifeline at a dark time, the best mentor anyone could ask for, the definition of a sage, a true icon, the ultimate mensch, the reason I believed in myself, the father I never had. These are just a few words that have been offered and recurrent themes in the hundreds of emails and texts that I have received over the last 48 hours about the man whose life we are here to celebrate, my father, Nate Berger. As complimentary, kind, and accurate as these words are, they will never entirely capture the indescribable spirit of my dad. He was all of these things and more. You've heard his accolades. You've heard the anecdotes so far from Revy, and I'm sure more to come And Uncle Melvin. I want to share some of just the, the thoughts that have filled me when I think about him. As his daughter, I have had the great blessing of having been cradled in his arms since the day I arrived on this earth. He taught, me, he taught me how to mow a lawn when I was four years old, something I don't think I've ever done again. <laughs> when I turned eight, shortly after we moved here, he taught me and my brothers how to rake the leaves from our front yard. We worked all morning creating this gargantuan pile with his effort being the lion's share. And then he made sure that my brothers and I had the opportunity to ruin all of his hard work by jumping in and scattering the leaves. When I was 11, I remember he held my hand firmly and whispered, you're going to be great, Pitts, right before I trepidatiously walked out to perform my first piano recital, after which I think I vomited. <laughs> when I was in high school, as Revy mentioned, it was commonplace for my dad to sit in that old red chair working away usually with a yellow pad and a pen in his hand on which he was doodling his latest grant or paper. And I would interrupt him to go over my homework. And he'd always put it aside without hesitation, sometimes Revy at his feet, Josh sitting in the room as well. But he would push it aside. He'd go over my homework. He'd ask me about my friends and their families. And whatever it is that I wanted to talk about, he was there to grill me at my PhD defense. Even though it wasn't his field, he asked me the hardest, most challenging questions. And I remember I had a really tough, I had a really tough thesis committee. And one of the, the most challenging <laughs> scientists who was, who was on that committee came up to me afterwards and said, who was that guy? He was really on point, but man, he can be mean. And I, <laughs> and I laughed and I said, well, that was my dad. And he said, well, that probably explains why you're so amazing. He was there to support and bless me in all the big and little steps that I have taken in my life, rally me on in the face of countless hurdles, big and small, that I've had to jump through in my youth and my adulthood. He welcomed with open arms my husband, Sammy, and my sisters-in-law, Lisa and April, into our family, despite the fact that their backgrounds were different than the Jewish tradition in which he was raised and the faith he felt he held so close to his heart and his identity because he felt it was better to embrace and learn from these differences than to fear or fight them. For those of you in this room who all knew my dad, you may know he frequently intimidated people when they first met him. His large stature, his booming voice, 
and what seemed like a tough and serious demeanor. But usually within a few meetings, if not a few minutes, they would see the brilliant twinkle in his eye and come to know his curiosity, his humor, compassion, and genuine kindness, as well as his penchant for breaking in to folk song or Christmas carols, especially if my mom was scolding him for something. And if there was still any concerns of intimidation, they would melt away once he introduced you to the love of his life, his partner in crime, who he affectionately referred to as his cute little Indian chick and his boss, Susie Berger, who's been by his side for nearly 60 years. He led our family and his professional endeavors embracing themes of humanity, service to others, and of course, pursuit of knowledge. He was resolute and he knew exactly what he wanted. But surprisingly, he was flexible with the ability to meet people where they were. He taught me and those around him so many lessons, often by word, but as Revy said, mostly by example. There are way too many to list now, but I'll share a few of the highlights that I hope that I have taken with me and I hope you will too. Number one, invite someone into your home. Break bread with them. Listen to their story. Listen carefully. Learn from it and care. Number two, start your morning with a song in your heart, no matter what the circumstance. For him, it was, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. And finally, and most importantly, number three, lift others around you because whether they have fallen and you need to offer them a hand or whether they are already soaring, everyone can use a little extra push. But these lessons in my heart, dad, if you're listening and you can hear all these amazing things that people are saying about you and the words they used to describe you, please let me add one more to it. You were my hero. Thank you. Nate's son, Joshua. Remember me when I am gone away, gone far away into the silent land, when you can no longer hold me by the hand. Nor I have turned to go, yet turning stay. Remember me when no more, day by day, you tell me of our future that you'd planned. Only remember me, you understand? It'll be too late then to counsel or pray. Yet if you should forget me for a while, and afterwards remember, do not grieve. For if the darkness and corruption leave a vestige of the thoughts that I once had, better by far, you should forget and smile, than you should remember and be sad. It's a poem by Christina Rossetti called Remember. Never heard of that before a few days ago. Probably read it and listened to it a hundred times since then. Probably listened to it and read it many more going forward. <sighs> Family, friends, colleagues of my father, <sighs> members of the International flower poster, photo posters on Facebook pages. If you know, you know. If you don't ask, so well. 
those who are here today and those who may be watching or streaming this on the Internet, honored guests, my entire family and I want to thank you all for coming here today and sharing your memories and your thoughts and listening to ours as we celebrate, we mourn, we honor this mountain of a man, this kind soul here today as we take him soon hereafter to, we take his body soon hereafter to his final resting place. I can't possibly expound upon the words that you've already heard or add anything more, really. You've heard his accomplishments have been noted, his praises have been sung. As his son, and he was probably my best friend, outside of my wife, Lisa, I just want to share my two cents worth on some of my uh, thoughts, how I'll remember him, and a couple things to ask of all of you going forward. First thought I have is, if you ask me how I remember him, I'm surprised this didn't come up beforehand. Big. <laughs> Everything about him, big. I mean, he was larger than life. He was, you know that saying, they broke the mold after they made him. Um, I don't think that was the case here. I think he broke the mold. He couldn't fit in it. My grandma used to tell my grandma used to tell this story about when he was born. He was ten and a half pounds. Doctor brought him out to, brought him out to her, all wrapped up in blankets. She unwrapped the blankets. There was this orange-haired orangutan staring back at him. Said so the doctor made a mistake. The doctor said she didn't make a mistake. She cried. Everything about him was big. He's larger than life. His Attitude was big. His appetite was big. His size was big. His demeanor was big. His temper tantrums were big. Everything about him was big. Nothing was small about him. The only thing small that he knew was looking under a microscope. That's it. <laughs> Anything else was big. His whole life he was big. But there was one thing that was bigger. There were two things that were bigger. One of them came in an itty-bitty package. And as Rabbi has alluded, as you've heard other people mention, and as most of you know, if you knew him, you knew my mother. You know my mother. Still remember, um, my wife tells this story about we were trying to teach my son Julian, or we were trying to figure out what he could, what he knew and didn't know at a young age. What was he, one and a half, two, something like that? Knee high to a grasshopper, whatever he was, trying to figure out if he knew people's names. He asked him, what's mommy's, real, what's mommy's grown up name? Lisa. What's daddy's grown up name? Uh, Josh. What's grumpy? Grandfather's grown up name? Uh, Nate. What's a muchie's? Grandmother's grown up name? Hey, Sue's! Even he knew at two years old or wherever he was that uh, she was the bigger part of him. And let there be no mistake, again, I'm not saying anything that anyone here didn't know. Without her, there was no him. Whether it was in the lab, at home, whether it was him sitting there in, again, that big old chair, ugly as it may have been, writing his grant while she's sitting there writing in her science notebook, doing all the calculations to support that grant. Well, it was him coming home and saying, we're having a party for 300 people. And it was up to her to figure out how to corral a small army and to make it work. And year after year was the same thing. I'm not doing this for that man again next year. <laughs> and year after year she did it <laughs> because she loved him. And without her, there's no him. So I would ask, and this is coming from him, not from me, because if he was here right now, he would ask you guys, please be there for her, because she's going to need it. She's going to need it going forward. This is the love of her life for 60 years. And she would give it right back to him, too. 
she would tell him, any other woman would have married and divorced you three times by now. I'm not sure she understood exactly what the words were, but she got, she got the message across. He understood, and he would, he, would, he would rein it in. He got it. He got it. I guess the other thing I want to remember, in addition to that tremendous work ethic that he had with him, right until the end. I used to tell people, only half-joking, the man's going to work until three days before he died. I was off by two days. <laughs> got a grant and got, learned he was going to get published the day before he, was die, before he died. And he was propped up in that chair, that student program. He couldn't even move anymore. He had to have two nurses. And might have been me, I don't know. There were, there were several people who had to prop him up in that chair, sit him up there so he could get on the Zoom conference and address those students for their first conference, their first meeting. That was a couple of weeks before he died. And, you know, isn't it ironic? Isn't it something that a man who dedicated his whole professional life to science, to curing cancer, to helping other people make their lives better and survive, and prosper and thrive was taken away from us by this cruel and horrible disease. We don't even know the name of it, yet alone how, let alone how to treat it. But as it sapped him of his life, When it became clear that in some form or another this was going to be the disease that would ultimately do him in, take him to his appointments, and he would joke with uh, the doctor, doctor, who are they going to name the disease after, you or me? I think I should name it after me. I'm the one who got it. <laughs> Whatever. But even at the end, at the very end, some of us were beginning to question whether he had lost his will to live. And I asked him, point blank, he was laying there in the bed. He couldn't move. Dad, have you lost your will to live? If you have, it's okay. I understand. We all understand. He said, tell everybody to be there at my birthday party on July 6th. I'll be there. <laughs> And even at the very end, I went from there. After he told me that, I told these two home nurses who were there with him. I said, I don't think he's lost his will to live. And one of the nurses immediately said, I could have told that. He never lost his will to live. He's got his will to live. Yeah? How do you know? Well, I've been doing this for however many, 15, 25, however many years it was. I don't know. And I see people who have lost their will to live, and I've seen people who have lost their will to live over the years. But she said, your father isn't one of them. In fact, I can hear the way he calls to your mother. Hey, Suze, come here and keep me company, will you? Take care of me. Sorry. I'm going to circle back to uh, where I started with this uh, beautiful poem, this Remember poem by Christina Rossetti. Just by saying something, it's been said a hundred different ways by I don't know how many thousands of different people. But um, the essence of it is won't be sad, it's over. Be glad that it happened. I was uh, asked by Serena and my sister to announce that um, the best is yet to come here. Um, as someone mentioned, uh, maybe it was Serena, maybe it was Ruby, he had, or maybe it was Uncle Mel, I don't know. The man loved his. Folk, sing, folk songs, folk singers, and he was a big Woody Guthrie fan. And one of his favorite traditions, particularly at Thanksgiving, 
we would sit there around the dining table with however many people were there, 10, 30, I, it doesn't matter, family, friends, strangers from the street, people just happened to be in town. He put out a printout of This Land is Your Land by Woody Guthrie. And he'd have us all sing it to the point where year after year after year after year after year, we're like, oh, God, this again. <laughs> but uh, we thought it would be appropriate that we send him to his final resting place with this land is your land. And if I, I've been told that uh, you all received or there should be printouts of the song somewhere. So as, as a tribute to my father, Nate Dog. Um, we'd ask that you all sing along, and this is going to be performed by his two, two of his loving grandchildren, Julian Berger and Bruce Jacob Manny B.J. Berger. This land is your land, this land is your land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. I roamed and rambled, and I followed my footsteps to the sparkling sands of her diamond deserts, and all around me a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Julian. Before Bo and I uh, conclude our service, I want to make a little confession. When I meet with families before the funeral, I meet with them a day or two before, and we talk about what it is that's going to transpire. And when I hear families say, aside from you, Rabbi, there are going to be six speakers. I say to them as gently as I can, um, if each of them speaks for 15 minutes, that's going to be an extremely long service. Would you please try to encourage them to speak for two and three? And I am not at all sorry that I did not press them on this. 
we have been blessed, I, I feel it, maybe you do too, um, with a sense of the depth and the reach of Nate Berger. We heard about his work, his devotion from his family, from his colleagues, the variety of memories, the many different ways in which these six people have recalled him, uh, vindicates uh, uh, my, in retrospect, not pu pressing the point, even though I'm probably going to say it to the next family. Uh, <laughs> So I, 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 I hope you agree with me that um, we have uh, sat in on a very special set of uh, powerful reminiscences about a very, very wonderful human being. O oh God of life, amid the ceaseless tides of change which sweep away the generations, your love remains to comfort us and to give us hope. Around us are life and death, decay and renewal, the flowing rhythm that all things obey. Our life is a dance to a song that we cannot hear. Its melody courses through us for a little while, then it seems to cease. Whence the melody and whither does it go? In darkness as in light, we turn to you the source of life and the answer to all of life's mysteries. As you are able, I invite you now to rise for the El Mole Rachamim. El Mole Rachamim, Shochen Bamromim, Am Semenu Chanechonat, Hachat Kanfe Hashchina, Bemalot Kedoshim Otorim, Kizor Hararakia Mazirim, Et Nihishmat Nachum. Ben Moshe Velayla, Shahalach le Holamo, Began Eden, Tehemenu Hato, Ahna Baharachami Mastirei, who beseter can a fahale olamim, Vititror, Bitrora Chayemat Nishmato, Adonai Hunahalato, Bianuak Bishalom, Amishkavo, Vinomar. Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe. Grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Nathan Allen Berger, our loved one who has entered eternity. O oh God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. And let us say together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. On behalf of the family, I want to announce that uh, the uh, family of Nate Berger will receive friends at the residence at 2717 Layton Road. They will receive you tonight from 5.30 to 8.30, and then tomorrow and the next day, Wednesday and Thursday, from 4 in the afternoon until 7 o'clock in the evening. Tonight, there will be a minion service at the residence at 6 o'clock. Our service will continue now at Graveside at the Mayfield Cemetery. And once again, on behalf of the family, thank you so much for your participation and presence this afternoon.
Oh yeah, uh, Mrs. Resnick. No. Oh. No. 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 I got to have the key.